Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As always, it is a great joy to be with you all and together to praise our very good God. This morning, we'll continue to read and hear from God's Word in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9, if you're using the Red Bibles in front of you, that will be on page 1167. This is the well-known account of the conversion of Saul, apostle, missionary, highly controversial theologian, (laughs) but here, an enemy of the Lord. Acts 9 and verses 1 to 19, brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to the word of the Lord. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, He saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the way by which you came has sent me, so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. Father, we do ask that you would open our eyes to see and give us light, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. The conversion of Saul takes a special place in medieval theology. It's an an example of what God can potentially do for everyone and anyone. That is, knock them off their horses or sweep them off their feet with a light and a voice from heaven and just convert them. The only problem, of course, is that This account is obviously an exception, and God has, in fact, not chosen to ordain this for the rest of us. So while God could have saved you without any effort on your part, God has nevertheless decided that, unlike Saul, you will have to try your best in order to be saved. And even as Protestants on this Reformation Day, It is hard to see Saul's conversion as anything more than an extraordinary occurrence 
never to be repeated and seemingly never has been repeated. But Paul himself insists in 1 Timothy 1.16 that his conversion is an example or pattern of all who were going to believe in Jesus. In our brief time together, then, it will profit us to look more closely at this passage. And behold, in the conversion of Saul, Jesus' power to save his people, whoever they are. We see this in the incorrigibility of the persecutor, in the inability of the paralyzed, and in the instrumentality of the penitent. First, the incorrigible persecutor. In previous chapters, we have already seen glimpses of Saul's personality. In chapter 7, he was guarding the garments of those who stoned Stephen. Throwing off the caution of his own highly esteemed mentor, the rabbi Gamaliel, who urged the Sanhedrin back in chapter 5 to leave the Christians alone lest they be found opposing God, Saul took it upon himself to wreak havoc in the church, leading a house-to-house inquisition and dragging both men and women to prison. It's an equal opportunity persecutor. But rather than curb the spread of Christianity, Saul's persecution only accelerated it as the Christians preached the word up in Samaria and wherever they were scattered. Saul, however, was unfazed and determined to hunt them down wherever they went. In our passage at the beginning of chapter 9, we see him breathing threats and murder. And Saul's smoldering breath could be smelt in Damascus, 150 miles north of Jerusalem. And just as the Pharisees and Sadducees, once arch rivals, plotted together to kill Christ, so Saul, this Pharisee of Pharisees, had no problem seeking and obtaining a warrant from the high priest, who were by default Sadducees, in order to kill Christians. This is no coincidence. The Lord had warned, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. John 15, 18. But this is but the continuation of our Lord's own persecution. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Our Lord, in his estate of exaltation, elevated to the right hand of the Father in all his majesty and authority, is telling Saul, you're hurting me. These are not just my people. This is my body. Oh, Saul, why would you add to my affliction? Oh, Christians, take comfort that having been united to Christ, none can hurt you without the notice of your jealous husband in heaven. Be assured that no fiery arrow of the enemy can touch you, but what had to first pierce through the body of our Lord. The question is whether you find it too much trouble to suffer with Jesus. Saul would crucify our Lord with his own hands if he could, and then still be convinced that he is doing God a service. At this point, he really isn't that much different from the Islamic terrorists who still hang Christians on crosses or slit their throats and then go on to say things like, Alhu Akbar, God is the greatest. But what is your attitude towards these people? Are you driven by fear? or by a God who is powerful to save the most incorrigible persecutor. You might protest, but don't you know they're fanatics? I mean, they have guns, and there are so many of them, and they're just not going to believe. But isn't this what the gospel is about, brothers? 
grace abounding to the chief of sinners? If not for this fanatic Saul, the gospel would not have reached your ears. Maybe we are the ones who won't believe. And adapting our Lord's word, what good is it if you only love those who love you? Don't the terrorists do the same? Secondly, we see the inability of the paralyzed. An 18-year-old son of four generations of preachers was on his way to a successful career in football when one day he was flung out of a car going at 75 miles an hour and rolling on his back the full 100 yards until he was embedded with asphalt. Still completely conscious, this young man by the name of John MacArthur, now in his 50th year of ministry, said to the Lord, Whatever you want, I give. In Acts 22, and also in the majority text tradition of verse 6, here in chapter 9, Saul responded similarly to the Lord. Lord, what will you have me to do? He knew the Lord wanted something and that he was not going to be denied. C.S. Lewis wrote of his own conversion, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. Doesn't sound like the most glorious doctrine, does it? A fundamentalist pastor once told me, God doesn't drag anyone into heaven screaming and kicking. And that is true. Usually people who go to he heaven have died. <laughs> but praise the Lord, he doesn't wait for you to get your act straight or even your thinking straight but snatches you out of the fire, often still screaming and kicking. And how often do you run right back to your sin like a dog to the vomit? And the Lord has to pull you out again and again and wash you clean. But that is what a loving father does, isn't it? That's what I often have to do to my own daughter, yank her away screaming and kicking. She does a lot of that. <laughs> I don't take the 99 steps to her to tell her that she's responsible for taking the one step off the street or just let the truck run her over. That's insane. And it's more insane to, to think that your father in heaven would love you any less. This is not cold Calvinism. No one is advocating just waiting for people to get zapped from heaven. But when you go out to share the gospel, which Calvinists have sometimes been known to do, <laughs> and the unbeliever standing in front of you just can't get it or just won't get it, and you forgot what you learned in apologetics class, do you just give up? Or do you plead, Lord, give light now, Lord, reveal the glory of your Son. Or have, you been or have you become skeptical that the Lord can save just like that? That he can turn sinners on a dime? Thirdly, notice the instrumentality of the penitent. Saul's testimony of his own conversion from this violent past is recorded twice more in the book of Acts in chapters 22 and 26. He would allude to it in letters to the Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, and Timothy. The apostles' past as a murderous persecutor is no unimportant detail and certainly no unfortunate circumstance. And even though it would seem that all his life he had been raised to oppose Jesus Christ, 
Paul would write in Galatians 1.15 that he was set apart from before his birth for service in the kingdom. There would be no Apostle Paul without their first being the persecutor, Saul. His learning in the renowned schools of Tarsus would, engage, would enable him to engage the Athenians on Mars Hill. His rabbinical training under Gamaliel would be used to refute the Jews and the Judaizers. His zeal with which he pursued the disciples into distant lands would be turned to make him the greatest missionary of all times. Indeed, it was precisely the greatness of his sin that led him to see the greatness of Christ's mercy and worked in him the boldness to face fearlessly the same kind of opposition that he had once leveled against the church. God has a plan to redeem his people, to free them from the bondage of the enemy. And not only can nothing stand in its way, but nothing really stands in its way at all. Just because we don't see the light from heaven doesn't mean it isn't the same God who called light out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. By faith you too have seen our Lord's face. Saul's conversion is an example of what happens every day. God doing all things according to the counsel of his own will, saving whomever he has chosen and calling them to his, into his service. Isn't that why you are here? Brothers and sisters in the Lord, do not fear the increasing hostility towards Christianity. Do not despair when the enemy is at the gates or even when you smell his very breath of threats and murder. But wait upon the Lord, Lord who is able to save one like Saul and one like you and me. He who has ears, let him hear. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we do ask that as you removed the scales from Saul's eyes, that you would cause us also to see your power to save, we ask in Christ's name.